Good day and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your seats because we got a dynamo of talent. Our next guest is a force to be reckoned with in both the acting and producing world, and you've probably seen him in some of your favorite TV and film shows. From Hitman 101 to Keepin' Coffee, he's been delivering hits with style and charisma. But wait, there's more. He's been an integral part of projects like Standard Action, Signed, Sealed, Delivered, and Unreal, proving time and again that he's got the magic touch. And if that weren't enough, he's taken us on a wild ride in Nancy Drew and had us on the edge of our seats in the main event. You may have even spotted him in the charming town of Virginia River or heard his voice in the epic Portal 2, the musical. But it doesn't stop there, folks. He's not just a master of the screen, but also a guru of all things gaming as a manager of RPG fan and co-host of the wildly entertaining Random Encounter podcast. When he's not lighting up the screen or discussing all things RPG, you might catch him in your local acting class or finding yourself laughing alongside each other at the improv as he sharpens his skills, getting ready for his next big role. Please welcome Greg Delmage. Greg, thank you so much and welcome to the show, sir. Uh, Hi, thank you for having me. Um, You've given me big shoes to fill that made me sound so much more important and talented than I really am, and I'll take it. Thank you. We, hey, we listen, actors like our ego stroked, and I won't say no. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> hey, listen, I, I think it's, it's it's fabulous, and I appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, I, I want to ask you, what drew you to the world of, of writing and getting into RPGing? Oh, for the RPG fan, yeah, I've... um. When my my downtime uh, is is being a big old video gaming board gaming nerd, and uh, and yeah, RPGs have always spoken to me. I just uh, I'm a, I'm an only child, so um, I'm used to playing games on my own and just getting lost in those worlds and stories and such. So uh, yeah, I, I've gone to RPGFan.com for years uh, to look at the reviews and news and keep up on the latest. And um, and I started listening to their podcast, Random Encounter, which was started by um, Robert Steinman before he left ages ago and got to listen to that. And then they eventually started some sister podcasts like Rhythm Encounter, which talked about music and RPGs, which I love. Like I could go to no end talking about music and in video games. And uh, I love it. And, uh, and I love listening to it and talking about it. And uh, I'm one of the regular people on that podcast now. And I write reviews for the site Um for music nowadays because i just don't have the time to keep up with uh playing video games regularly uh as i now have a almost one year old uh, and she likes a lot of time which you may hear in the background apologies uh she uh did not want to nap today so we'll get her down hopefully but anyways uh so what drew me to that was being a fan of it long time i've always wanted to to write and contribute and and give back to the site and it just thought it'd be a lot of fun to take my writing talents uh, as a copywriter and stuff like that and try and translate that into writing reviews and such and then there just happened to kind of be an opening robert stepped away from the podcast my friend derek who i started to get to know through online stuff through the site uh stepped in as a host and i was like hey so i noticed you might have a gap um if you champion me i like i'd love to come in and help you and he's like yeah for sure and then before i knew it i was in and i was helping them produce video content for youtube and then still trying to do reviews and stuff um and like i said a lot of that fell to the wayside because family priorities came over and uh just don't have the time to to edit for free as much as i used to and uh, and i don't co-host our our random encounter anymore just because it was just too much of a time commitment that i just couldn't block out as much so jono logan has taken over and he's fantastic uh he was my co-host for ages and passed the keys to him I mean, I was never even expecting to be a host of Random Encounter because Derek, within like a few episodes, was like, so I'm stepping away. I was like, oh, so I guess if this needs to keep going, it's me now. Hey, so so that's kind of what it is. I just I just love talking about. I mean, I can make this entire episode with you about talking about that instead of acting, but (laughs) it's not what we're here for. Oh, no, on the contrary, it's all about you, which is perfect. Oh, and first you. of all, congratulations on your on your daughter, year and a half. And uh, yeah, um, the, uh, the nap schedule is always hectic. <laughs> It's difficult and it's it's been a learning curve. Um, my, my wife, Annette, uh, we met doing a play years ago. She's also an actor and producer and uh, the, more closer to the force to be reckoned with that you described me as. Uh, like she's just a bulldog when it comes to getting things done and producing content and directing and all that stuff. Um, and she has a daughter of her own. So I had my stepdaughter, Gwen. Uh, who has moon, been moonlighting on RPG fan podcast actually with me now and again because she's an avid Pokemon fan oh, nice. and uh, likes to talk about all that stuff too. But uh, coming in as a stepdad was a very different thing. So having my own daughter 
uh, that's my own flesh and blood. There's definitely a shift, and um, and and it's a very different thing. Also, being there from the get go, whereas with Gwen, I was kind of p- skipped the the hard years, as people call them, and I mostly came in like five six, mm-hmm. uh, which come with their own difficulties of a lot of why. Uh, you never want to hear why again, and I'm not looking forward to that again. But I am enjoying, yeah, having the kids because I think even both Gwen and now Eloise, my current daughter. Um, they helped me become and have helped me become a better actor. Uh, not simply because of the wear and tear and making me look more like a dad, but also I um, I have something else to care about. If that makes sense, um, you know, you might you might get that. Well, what, what do you mean by that? I, I I certainly understand that piece, but some of our our viewers and listeners not might not. Could you explain that a yeah. little bit more? Absolutely. Uh, it was it was interesting. It was um, uh, the day I proposed to my wife. Uh, we went to a workshop, um, and I'm blanking on his name. He's a lovely actor out of LA uh, who was in town just teaching here in Vancouver, BC. And he, uh, one of his tenets for like being a good actor was have something else. You know, don't don't make it all about your auditions and waiting by the phone and stuff. Like, you're going to auditions. And, you know, but also be going for groceries, have your grocery list, have your to-do list, have that sort of stuff. Because, uh, and I can speak to this, like when you're desperate, they sense that. And also it really affects your work because the work comes more about, look at me, hire me, please pick me. And less about, I'm just a regular human here to solve your problem. Like you, you, you have a possibly me shaped hole to fill in as waiter number one or Steve, the bank manager or whatever. Um, and I need to be a real person, not someone who's just desperate to get hired. And so having those other things in your brain and other things you care about more than waiting by the phone, it doesn't mean like you're not giving the work uh, less focus or less than it needs, but it's, it's just, it's, if it doesn't work out, you're like, that's fine. I still have other things to do today. Here's my to-do list. And this was on it. Well, and that's just it. Exactly. Because yeah, it's just, it's, it's hard when you measure yourself by success and failure of auditions and booking things, because that's the other thing is like, they're so out of your control. I mean, I think people don't quite realize that. And especially like with the current climate, as of this recording with uh, the SAG after strike is still happening. Uh, And thankfully WGA strike is over at this point. And I hope SAG after can kind of dovetail off that and get what they need as well, which will make our positioning better up here in BC when we have our UBCP actor uh, negotiations in 2025. But it's, um, uh, as I was saying, it's, 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 it's so out of our control to be able to, to, to do that. And I don't think a lot of like the lay person at home watching TV really gets that. So when they see us on strike or whatever, they just roll their eyes and like, Oh, freaking actors getting paid so much money. And blah, blah, blah. it's like, yeah, but like there's a 1% that get booked so regularly that they make a living off of that. The rest of us, like, you know, you do like 20 to a hundred auditions a year before you ever book one. If you're lucky, right? Like I book three times a year on, and that's maybe like so far, that's my record. And like, and that's maybe, anywhere between three to like seven days on set. I've had one, one gig so far that gave me 10 days on set, which was an unreal TV, which we can talk about, but um, it's, we, we so rarely get to work. So when we get finally paid those amount of money, it, it's great because it offsets all the negative that you and hours we've put into just trying to book something that is so beyond our control. You know, we are just trying to show up and hope that they like our vibe, our hair, our eyes, whatever. And we suit we suit what they need. You know, it's interesting that you talk about how we have these things that are out of our, our control. And certainly is it your hair, your look, your eye, your smile, your height, uh, yeah. literally anything. And you could give an amazing yeah. performance, but they're going to say, Hey, you look like that person in high school that licked chalkboards. I don't think I want you on my set. And- exactly. It's a constant, that's a, a constant uh, <laughs> re- reference people make, but it's, it's not invalid. So with that in mind, how do you how do you go against this tidal wave of rejection that's just waiting to come from auditions <laughs> and never hearing back? Like, how do you just grab that surfboard and ride those waves and get through? What, what does Greg do? Uh, Greg took a lot of work to get there. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I get that question a lot, even when I was doing the usual like server actor thing and fellow servers and and clients would ask the same sort of thing. Like, what's it like? And I'm like, it's imagine going on a first date. And then never hearing back. And then you do that like 50 times. So you get real used to like reject 
chin and real used to, well, you have to, otherwise you go insane. You have to get used to not knowing why. And that's usually the hardest part, especially as a new actor, like the first few years that I was here in Vancouver trying to make it, so to speak. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, my first agent was a waste of my time for six months. My second agent um, got me in the room at least, but like I still was, I didn't book anything with them. And then they eventually let me go through, I don't know. They just, they weren't a very nurturing agency. And then I found my current agent, Les Blackmore, BLK management, uh, who's been great. Um, and he understood where I was at and, and then I had to work on myself. And I think once I had that better relationship that helped me have a better mindset towards approaching the acting and it wasn't from that desperation place. And then I had that shift of realizing it is out of my control. All I can do is show up and do the best work I possibly can and just be confident. I did the work and I'm ready for the opportunity when it works out, which uh, oddly enough, I think it's when I started booking more is because again, caring less about the work um, and just being better prepared about for the work, it just, the two things kind of worked. So it's, um, the biggest thing I do is just don't compare your success to others. That was the other big shift that happened for me is like seeing friends of, I'm not their type, you know, I'm not a, a brunette woman. I'm not a half Asian man. Like I can't, I'm not going for those roles. And yeah, if they're booking like three times a month, great for them, you know, or like there's a black guy on our roster named Reese for um, an agent. He's like pretty much my agent's bread and butter. But he, I'm, I'm not a bald black man, you know, and uh, and there's definitely a market in Vancouver because there's just not enough of them. So he books a lot. And that's so amazing for him. And you have to celebrate those successes instead of comparing yourself to them, because they're, they're just there's something different that you can never do. And trying to hold yourself to that, you're just going to drive yourself nuts. So you have to accept. I showed up. I did my best job. My general mantra is. I'll be shocked if I don't get it or sorry, I won't be shocked if I get it. And I won't be shocked if I don't get it. Cause it's so beyond my control. It's the ones that I'm like, eh, I maybe could have done better. I don't know. That's where I'll like, I'll be shocked if I get it. But at the same time, this industry, you never know my booking on Virgin river. I thought I like, uh, not that I bombed it, but I didn't think I did that great. And then uh, casting director, Tiffany Mack booked me in. And then it became this recurring thing. Like you never know. <laughs> I, I love that analogy about the the first day. You walk into every audition like it's the first day, and then you're just ghosted. You have no yeah. clue. <laughs> yeah, it's only like maybe indie directors, if you're lucky, that tell you, hey, sorry, thanks for coming in. But like casting directors don't have time if they called every actor like that. And especially now when they're doing tapes from home, like their workload has quadrupled. Um and like, and casting directors do have a lot of power, especially here in BC, and it can be intimidating to actors. But like, just, just like you, they have a job to do. They have to fill a, a hole and fix a problem for production, and have these people hounding them to get something done on like a tight deadline. Try and see hundreds of different types of talent, and also try and keep in their talent they know that kind of books and like it, it's not an easy job. And uh, and I and you have to recognize that we're all on the same team. So if you show up and are the best you can be, you're helping them. And yeah, I just trust that like I gave my best and my best either just wasn't good enough or just wasn't right. And that's fine. Where can I improve? Like it takes a lot of like self-awareness and self-reflection because unfortunately casting just can't give that to you. They don't, that's not their job, you know? So as much as we might decry like, oh, could they give us more? Can we get better readers? Can we get more? notes or whatever some of them are great at it and they know exactly what they want and they ask you for it. and then as actors we're we're bitchy about it and then we're like oh they didn't really give me a chance to like find myself and find my own thing because all their notes and i feel so stifled creatively i'm just like oh my gosh uh we're actors we complain a lot we never quite work hard enough and we uh we're never happy <laughs> it's hard <laughs> to find that middle ground <laughs> So when we, when we hear all of this from you, what was the the passion and discovery for you getting into acting? What was that aha moment that you said, that's that's the for me, the tidal wave of rejection, the being ghosted <laughs> on first dates and, and uh, you know, perhaps dying your hair red. Uh, <laughs> how did you fall in love with that passion? Uh, well, acting started for me as a kid. I was five, six, I think. And my aunt was like, Joanne, my mom. Uh, I think Gregory would be perfect for this role in The Wizard of Oz. Uh, so back in southwestern Ontario, where I'm from, there's a great professional theater company called the Heron County Playhouse. And they were putting on uh, what I remember being a pretty fantastic production of The Wizard of Oz, uh, which now holds a special place in my heart because it was my very first booking. I got paid $50 for it. I went to Munchkin and the Lollipop Guild. I hated the bald cap. 
Uh, and it was neat. I mean, I got taken out of school for it, which when you're in kindergarten, that doesn't really affect you. So it wasn't like, a, oh, sweet. It was it was just like, a, this is my job, because like, it was a pretty intensive professional process. Um, and I liked it a lot. And then when my folks, unfortunately, split around seven, eight, and I moved to Ottawa, I think it was like a couple of years later, like nine, 10, I went to my mom and was like, hey, I liked doing that acting thing. Can I do more of that? Can we like find something like that? And, and she, as my mom always does, whenever I express like the words, I would like to come out of my mouth. And she's already found like six workshops available to me because my mom, for all her love and her faults, is like just put me first. And it was wonderful. And I wouldn't be where I am today without that. And yeah, I got into some local workshops and just started doing more stuff and fell in love with it. And um, I was also kind of gearing myself possibly to go to the Air Force, uh, going through air cadets and stuff like that. So it was kind of like acting or pilot. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the piloting stuff didn't quite pan out for me uh, for one reason or another, but I was just falling more and more in love with acting and was like, you know, I can always play a pilot. So I, uh, <laughs> uh, which I finally kind of did actually just last, this past year. Um, and it was, uh, it was, yeah, I just, I just really like it. Like there's, the more I, once I finally like booked my first thing on Timeless here, uh, well, professional, I booked a few indie acting gigs, but my first professional gig was on Timeless, uh, uh, rest in, rest in peace after two seasons. And uh, I was just so ecstatic. Like, you know, I call my mom, I call my dad, my best friend. I was like, I did it. I finally booked the thing. I'm here at like 6am. I'm in the parking lot. I'm going to go do the thing. And, and nothing so far has really excited me in the same way work-wise to want to still get up at 4 a.m. and just be like, I like it. And I know the second that stops where I'm just like, I have to get up and go to set today. That's when I should stop. Mm -hmm. But so far that hasn't happened. I mean, I like making movies in any way, but still acting is like the the thing. It just, it fulfills me. There's something about it the way I, when I do get to play um, and being a part of the set and being a part of the team and making things, it's, yeah, it's it's worth the rejection. It's there's still a, I have that resiliency and that acceptance, and I'm okay with it. And I, and there's part of it too at this point. It's like the sunk cost fallacy of like I've already put so much into it, and I'm this late in the game, is that I can't really back out per se. And also, people like me are are falling off. So then there's more opportunities for me too, right? So, so when we when we listen to you talk about this, you know, do five six, you were you were in the uh, the Munchkins plays, you you got that <laughs> thirst for it. Um, understanding that you wanted to pursue this as as a career path and mm. and passion and love how do you feel that helped shape who you are today i that's a good big question um it's made me resilient it's made me very um flexible and adaptive to change and oh it's a baby um maybe very adaptive to change and uh and being able to to commit, I guess, to like stick to things. It's um, cause yeah, it's, it's challenging. There's times where it's, it's a, a brutal on the ego and, uh, and it's hard not to measure your worth by your castings. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it has also made me a better person um, in terms of like just emotionally and mentally. Uh, I've done a lot of growth and a lot of inner reflection uh, you know, finally going to therapy, which helped me become a ba better actor. But before that, it was the therapy of going to classes and being called out on your crap and finding new ways to interpret scripts and, and sides and stuff in scene studies and such. It's It really opened me up as a human being to be a better human and be more a better listener, more accepting uh, of other people's thoughts and criticisms and putting the focus on them, uh, which is always, in my mind, the key as an actor is to give the attention to the other person. It's not about you. It's about what you're there for them kind of thing. And, and, and yeah. And, and, and having, again, the, the fortune of having a great director and actor and my wife who's here to help me coach on, we coach each other and find different avenues uh, in our scripts and our acting as well. Like it all just has improved me as a person by opening me up uh, to deeper parts of my emotion, which I'm still working on, but it's, my emotional depth and my acceptance of so many things in life, I think is a product of my acting that I wouldn't have had if I had just stayed some farm kid in Ontario. <laughs> so when we talk about that, is there, is there anything that you do, let's say a hobby, for example, that contributes to your creative growth and your personal growth that isn't acting or creating content? 
Yeah, that's, uh, absolutely. It's uh, which is funny because you had so many auditions when I was a non-union uh, actor uh, for commercials where they ask you those questions. I'm like, what are their hobbies? What are the things you like? So like, I'm ready for this question. And they always <laughs> say like, but you can't say acting because uh, obviously you're there for it, mm-hmm. even though I do love making indie films and stuff. But uh, outside of acting, yeah, like that's part of the reason why I got involved in RPG fan because I love playing video games and talking games and being on podcasts and editing content was another way to express my creativity and uh and, and also like playing dungeons and dragons and role-playing tabletop games uh it's another fun way of being able to like express other facets of myself and still find a creative outlet while doing that um my writing sometimes allows me to do that too as a copywriter just you know, sometimes i can get more clever with blogs or with uh <laughs> social media posts and stuff and then through my my day job of doing a lot of corporate editing and such and my editing i did at rpg fan i found a love for editing and the storytelling and that and i finally started doing some narrative editing um on a great little web series uh dr fish pants poems about magical creatures uh Mm -hmm. which i don't think is like live for people to see yet in general because it's doing its festival circuit yet but eventually it might come up but that was my first narrative gig because my wife was producing on and she's like hey listen my husband wants to do more so I did that. That was fantastic. It's a comedy web series and it turned out great. And I'm very proud of my work. And then I've since done a couple other things. So it's like, uh, yeah, there, there's plenty of things. Uh, my ADHD definitely takes me into all kinds of different directions and that brings me joy, but it's, it's uh, definitely a lot of it rooted in video games and, and board games and spending time with my family. Now, when, when you talk this passionately about, about gaming and your family, you know, everyone's going to want me to ask you, are you a, a, a PC? Is it a console? What what kind of gaming do you do you say, hey, you know, I'd rather boot up the computer versus turning on a, a console? Where where does Greg lie in that realm? Honestly, everywhere. Uh, I, I am not, uh, uh, if, I, <laughs> if I can use the term, I'm, I'm a slut for consoles and games. I'll play, I'll play anything and do anything anywhere. <laughs> I, I, um, I love my Nintendo Switch. I'm a Nintendo fan for years. Uh, it was my first console, and I and the Switch is just so awesome for uh, for its flexibility, and there's a lot to play on it, and a great machine for RPGs. But I also, like many gamers, have a ridiculously long uh, Steam backlog library, and my computer is built for editing and for decently powerful gaming. So I like to go sailing on the high seas and like see if these with my best friend back in Ontario, and we'll just chat and get into shenanigans as pirates, um, or you know, do Snowman's Sky, or I have a bunch of other things like I will play all my PC exclusively that just strategy games I find are just better there. Like mouse and uh, is much better consoles just don't quite do it, but I love me so many fun adventures and uh, side scrollers and RPGs and stuff that I can play on the switch or on the PS4. So I, where, wherever the game is. And I still have like so many of our old retro systems. I'll still boot up the Wii now and again, I'll still use my PS2 for some of my old PlayStation games. I'm, I'm not a snob about it. I just, wherever I can play the game and enjoy it, and that's where I'll do it. <laughs> Perfect. That's a fabulous answer. And, you know, when we switch it back to, to acting here, is there any genre or type of role that you're particularly interested in? Like you love action versus horror or drama versus comedy, or maybe you want to kind of do the next Ryan Reynolds free guy and have an RPG movie with you in it? That would be amazing. Um, sci-fi, though. Sci-fi is definitely where my heart live sci-fi and fantasy like i would love to do anything in that genre which thankfully a lot of it does come to to bc i just haven't been cast in it i've gone out for a couple roles for like something like lost in space and stuff like that and the 100 back when i was here and just didn't quite seal the deal but i uh yeah i guess the closest i got was supernatural when i finally like snuck onto the very last episode of that (laughs) after yeah, it's like kind of like the Vancouver rite of passage is to get on supernatural and i like got right in at the last minute um and then got murdered right away uh spoilers um <laughs> but it was uh it was funny i would love to do more sci-fi and fantasy stuff uh, my wife and i both love it and it's and just some cool high concept stuff like the expanse or any of like i would retire the next day if i got to do play on star wars in any capacity i'd be happy you know so uh stuff like that would just make my heart sing all the more and low-key westerns wouldn't mind doing western anson mount and um hell on wheels like i would have loved to have gone up for hell on wheels so much uh yeah that stuff's really cool as well now is there anything that you're currently working on that you can share with us 
I mean, season five of Virgin River just came out, which I'm not in. Uh, my last season I was in was season four, um, which uh, was it was good. Uh, my content unfortunately got cut. I didn't make like the final cut because I think I was like a C or D thread at that point for my little uh, desp- deputy that could somehow keeps getting stuff out there. Um, and, but I'm not dead, so I could come back. Who knows? Just went to jail. Um, spoilers for anyone catching up on Virgin River but uh, otherwise no I had uh, two gigs this year uh, but I don't think actually no I I think I don't think my episode is aired but I'm on The Irrational that show is started with starring Jesse L. Martin Uh, so I'll have a a small bit part on that and then I have another series based on a a book that's been filming around here uh, based on a pretty significant a uh, news event that happened out here. So um, that one will be cool when it comes up. And I got to do a couple of days on that, which was fun. And then there was a feature film that I did that I don't think is anywhere near done. So I can't talk about that one either, but that was uh, as much as I didn't get to do a ton on it. And who knows if I even made the cut, it was still one of the coolest things I got to do. So I'm excited to share stuff from that. Cause uh, I got to do some pretty neat things that will all the uh, long core memory for a while. <laughs> but uh, other than that, Nothing too crazy. My wife and I are just trying to get stuff made and uh, and go from there. She wants to get some directing, more directing done. We're just kind of antsy after so long of being on break with yeah. baby and stuff to, to get creating and do things and uh, get her into the local director's guild and get her on TV shows directing because she has a fantastic eye for that. Fabulous. And, and Greg, if I asked you, what is something that people tend to misunderstand about you the most? What would you say? <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, uh, perhaps, uh, my resting bitch face, hmm. um, <laughs> if I can put that not so mildly, uh, it's my, un- unfortunately, uh, something of a calling card. Uh, even my, my, my agent will get calls from like a uh, casting director being like, yeah, Greg's going to be per- perfect for this. Cause of his resting bitch face. Hmm. Uh, cause I'm generally a happy person, <laughs> but when I'm just like, just sitting content or serious, I just look really unapproachable like just some jackass white guy. Um, and that's the other thing is they often, I mean, this, this just screams white privilege. So I get those roles, uh, literally my role on um, the magicians I was cast because I was white privilege mm. on paper, basically uh, Christina strain showrunner on that one. knows she was, she saw me and she's like, he's perfect. Cast him, love him. <laughs> he's just everything we need to hate. Um, and so it was great. That was a fun role too. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so like uh, I'm not I'm a lot more approachable. I think people give me credit for at first glance is I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, once I open up, I, I definitely have like a bit of the walls, but I, they come down and I'm pretty free to talk openly about anything. Once people take a second to get to know me, and then won't get me to shut up. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. And Greg, what's something that that scares you? Oh, scary. Um, I mean, at this point, yeah, priorities have definitely shifted now. Like my anything happening to my daughter is like uh, is just terrifying to me. Um, you know, <laughs> a lot of those articles about people abusing children and stuff now hit real close to home now, and uh, you just can't fathom it. And um, and honestly, as as an actor, I uh, I definitely struggle with like the the fear of delivering of, of of performing, so to speak. So like when I have to hit those like em- emotional moments where I'm still struggling with as a person and even, and trying to do like right. on command or whatever, as an actor, like that still scares me. And it's something for me to keep working through and probably why I take, still take coaching and still go to therapy and stuff. Um, it, honestly and genuinely expressing myself is it's not so much that I'm not afraid to do that because I am, but it's the fear of my body kind of like getting in the way and being like, no, 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 you don't have to do this. Just slap a bandaid on it. It's fine. It's all pretend. And I'm like, but I need to body. Let me. And so I'm afraid that that gets in the way. Okay. And Greg, I have time for one last question for you. Yeah. I really appreciate your time today is, uh, of course, what makes Greg smile? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, love talking. Yeah. Like video games, movies, um, playing board games with my friends uh my cat doing just random stupid stuff um and uh my uh, watching my baby figure things out is is a source of a lot of joy and um and sending my wife stupid stuff on instagram and seeing her laugh at it really makes me laugh so uh those are those are some of the, the top picks oh and a good cup of coffee <laughs> that, that is fabulous and 
Uh, you know, Greg, as I said, it was my last question for you. Uh, thank you so much for coming out on Coffee with Chris today. Remember everybody out there to smile, to inspire, and have a fantastic, our amazing guest, Greg Delmage. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for having me, Chris.